what is the proper way to act in a tattoo shop? One of the things we get annoyed by. One of the times that I'm never going to forget is when we were locked up together, right? And plus, I was doing all right. I had, we had money, so you were eating. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're enduring. But here, but it ended up all bad for them because they started talking a lot of people here are not going to have it here, you know? It's more annoying. Tattooing family members or people who are, are like just regular public people? Family members. I was born in Jalisco, Mexico, but raised in South Central LA. How'd you meet my tia? Man, it's crazy. I know you better <laughs> met a girl high in the party line. That's how I met mine. <laughs> What's poppin'? It's your boy Moses, aka Nomo, chilling right here in the Let Out Podcast. I got a very special guest in the building. I got Mr. Spanky. Spanky Tijuana. What's up, man? What's up, everybody? That's right. She's right here chilling with my boy, my baby mama's nephew, right here in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Came to TJ. Welcome to Tijuana. Thank you. you know? Thank you. Yeah, typically we're in Southgate shooting the podcast, but today we're in Mexico. We're in TJ, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, my tío Spanky right here lives and shit. So, um, we're right here chilling in my shop, you know, it, um, came to came to chop it up. I haven't seen him in a minute, so it's good to see him, you know, and and then do something like this, you know. Let everybody know how everything is out here in Tijuana and how we live it and how we're doing things, man. Definitely. Like, um, a big part of your life recently has been in TJ, but you definitely want to start from the beginning. Why don't you tell us where you were born and where you grew up? I was born in Jalisco, Mexico, but raised in South Central LA. Lived all my life until, until I got deported in uh, 2009, so I've been here since. Yeah, what part of South Central did you grow up? Um... 54th and Main, 52nd and Main, all that area. Okay. Uh, how was it? What was like the 90s, the, the 2000s? What, what, what was your era that you were out there, you know, doing your thing? The 90s, definitely, man. It was hot. It was, yeah. It was, yeah, it was hot. 90s was, the, it was active. That's when all the shit was popping over there in, in all the LA area and all the, you know, the gangs and all that shit was, was cracking. Yeah. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the times that I'm never going to forget is when we were locked up together, right? Uh, we were locked up. I was only there for a few months. We were there for much longer, which eventually led you to be out here. Uh, tell me some of the things of like what kind of got you started on that path. Like what made you want to get into the, the life that got you in, in that trouble? Well, you kind of just kind of you kind of just walk into it. You know, I mean, you grow up in the neighborhood, you grow up in the hood, you, you grow up with the homies. And, you know, one thing one thing leads to another and we just get, ended up getting caught up. You know what I mean? And that's that's what it is. You know, it, it it's, it's a lot of good in that, but a lot of bad in that, too. You know, it's, it's like the pros and the cons of growing up that way. But, you know, it, it got me my trade. It got me to do what I do now, which is art and all that shit. But but um, back then, I didn't think of it that way. It was just like being out in the street and we just being active and fucking with the homies and going and partying here and there. And, you know, when, like I say, one thing leads to another. So I ended up, you know, going to jail and getting deported. Okay. How did you get your name Spanky? Um, kicking it with the homies. You know, I've always been a big dude and, 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 and with you, so from the little rascals. Okay. And always being, doing you know, fucking, fuck, you know, fucking up and shit like that. So the homie said, man, you know, you can call you Spanky. <laughs> That's right. Um, what are some of the things you remember about the night? What was like a fun thing to do? Like, you know, growing up with your homies and shit. What were you guys into? It was just partying, man. It was like the partying, the partying scene. And, um, and for me, one of the things that was really, really fun was, um, I got into airbrushing at, at that time. So I was all focused on airbrushing. You know, I had, I had my, um, my nightlife with the homies and stuff like that, but during the day and, and shit like that. And my free time was, uh, was doing airbrushing. So I learned a lot. It was, it was really, really fun for me. It kept me, it kept me, quote unquote, out of trouble for a while, you know, yeah. doing, getting into the airbrushing and I was very focused on it because I really liked it. Okay. Uh, we're definitely going to get into the art. How'd you meet my tia? Man, it's crazy. <laughs> I know you motherfuckers met, her, met a girl high in the party line. That's how I met mine. <laughs> <laughs> it was a party line? And then, yeah, in the 90s. There's, how there's met a lot her. of people that don't know about the party line. Why don't you explain what the party line is? The party line back then was... um. <clears throat> it was this this number you used to call, and it was a bunch of people in the line, and you know the, the high nas, and you you just hear everybody say, "What's up? Hey, who's that? Who's this?" And and then if you if you heard a girl's voice or whatever that you like, you try to get at her, and but there's already twenty other motherfuckers trying to get at her in the party line, so <laughs> that's what it was, you know. I, I, that's how I met her. I, I met your your tia, and it was fun, you know. You got to party with a lot of different people at that time, and then also the phone banging, you know. Now it's like internet. Banging back then, it was like phone banging and shit. We're just talking shit over the phone and all that, but yeah, it was fun, man. It was good times. Um, <laughs> so then you guys, you guys met up afterwards. You guys like linked. Up? Yeah, we met up. We hooked up, and and you know, we we were just doing the hanging out party together for a while, and then one thing led to the other, and you know, she ended up getting pregnant, and you know, 
Yeah. We ended up having a beautiful baby, you know? <clears throat> yeah, my prima. Shout yeah. out to Destiny. I know she's watching. Shout out to my baby. <laughs> a party line baby, not USC, baby. <laughs> yeah, from the party line to USC. <laughs> Getting her master's and shit. That's dope. Yeah. Um, well, obviously, you know, like, you led down to, now you're doing tattoos and stuff like that. Tell me about when you, the first time you fell in love with art, you know that you were good at art. I've always liked art since I was a kid, but um, I got more focused on it when, um, when like, the 90s, I started kicking it with the homies, and I started focusing more on it. During school, it was, it, it was, it, like, the teachers was pushing me towards that way because they saw talent in me, but I wasn't too concentrating on that. I was more like, it was more like doing letters for the homies, and, and for, even back then, I didn't do tattoos, but, but I used to do um, writing for homies that would get tattooed and stuff like that right there in the neighborhood, so. It, um, one thing led to the other, también with that, it, um, like I said, I, I ended up getting caught up with the airbrushing and that threw me way off course to where I'm at, I'm at now. I think that's one of the biggest important things that happened in my life, uh, running into airbrushing because that, um, that through the course of history and with my art thing towards leaning more towards art. I did graffiti, I did graffiti art también, so that had a lot to do with it, but it was mostly like the hanging out with the homies and doing patterns for them and things like that, you know? Uh, talk to me a little bit about your graffiti background. I did, um, I used to be from a crew, que se llama I2W, you know, I still fuck with my boys, my boy Pistol and them. Este, and it was, it was like an art thing, I mean, you know, um, we, uh, we would go piecing, we would go to piecing yards back then, it was like the motor yard and, and a bunch of other ones I don't remember, but it was just like getting together on the weekends and just going, doing, um, Productions and things like that, you know, and and I was pretty good at drawing, so it was it was it was easy for me to adapt adapt to doing characters and writing and all that stuff. You know, lettering was always one of my biggest um, talents. Um, so the the airbrushing was like a real big era in LA for a long time. It's like one of those forgotten arts at this point. Not that many people are rocking shirts for airbrush and stuff like that. Tell me more about the the culture of airbrushing. The way I got introduced to it. Este, I used to go to the Swami, I used to see it, but it never really grabbed my attention, you know. I would see the art and I was like, oh, that shit is cool. But one day I ditched from school, homie. I was, I was in school and I ditched. I ended up going to this ditching party. And this, 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 this dude, my boy Possessed Hugo, este, he, uh, he was doing some airbrush shit. And, and I, was just, I was just infatuated with the shit he was doing, man. It was crazy, you know. He was doing a little character. And I, at that time, I was into a lot of the graffiti things, so he it was leaning towards that, and I was like, man, I want to fucking learn that shit, you know? And uh, and I asked him a bunch of questions on how to get the stuff and where to get it, and and then what I what I did is I didn't really have no feria back then, so what I did is um, after that I used to go to the Swami a lot and just hang out and watch my boy C's at the Alameda Swami in L.A. Watch him airbrush all the time until you know I, I until I had the courage to talk to him and tell him that I was interested in learning and. He told me to get down on where to get everything, how to go about it, and and he gave me the opportunity to go hang out with him on the weekends to see him work. So that's that that kept me busy too for a long time, and it was one of the biggest things and one of the biggest things in my life that changed everything. You know that that put me on a different course like we were talking about earlier. Yeah, um, you know when you do when you, you know you're doing art for people, yeah, eventually gets to a point where you're not doing it just for your homies, right? You're doing it for customers, and they could be from anywhere. Right. Uh, did you ever have any difficulties running into like the wrong people or, or like maybe tattooing or airbrushing somebody that you would typically wouldn't want to airbrush for? Yeah, it happened, but I always been pretty professional as far as my work goes, you know? If it got out of line to where it needed to, if it was uh, out of line to where it would turn into a, a situation where I needed to get active as, 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 a, as a former gang member or, or as a member of, of a gang or whatever, it would, it would happen, you know, it, it wasn't a big deal. But for the most of it, it was just like doing my holly and that's it, you know? For exception of some people that I wouldn't tattoo and shit like that. But for the most of it, it you know, I was, I, I was open to everybody, you know? Tattooing and airbrushing. Um, it, was, it, it, was, it, it, it was very active with, with the tattooing thing back then because um, I was doing tattoos at home. I, st I started with the tattoos at home. So we'd go to different places and do tattoos and then I would always run into different motherfuckers I wasn't supposed to be with, you know? So yeah, yeah. It was, but it was cool. It was, it, 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 you know, you, it's those things that you can speak about and, and tell stories about now, which are interesting, you know, it's yeah. fun. Every, every business has a thing that sells the most. What was the thing people order the most from airbrushing? Like what, what would you do the most? Back in the nineties, it was really, really popping all the, all the quebradito clubs. I don't know if you remember that. Like the Spanish clubs. The Spanish clubs. So it was like groups of 50, 60 people from different kind of groups. They, they had different kind of names for them, for the groups. And it was more like um, 
paisa party, you know, it was like go to go to the paisa clubs and and go to the house parties with their with their groups, que los peloteros, que los malandrines, de sabe que, y que puras esas. So it was a lot of that. I, I mean, I made a lot of money th during that time because of those because of all those clubs. You know, we'd get orders of like 50, 60 shirts at a time, you know. And for somebody young like me, it was like, fuck, it, making that money was cool as fuck, you know. Yeah. You know, one of the memories I'm always going to have, I think I told you when we were locked up, that uh, it was Christmas, and it was like, like, Destiny was like maybe two or three, and you got her like 17 things. It was like a car, a computer. She was like three, and you got her like a computer yeah. and shit. Like, you've always been kind of like, like uh, balling, and, and you know, you always took care of your kids and shit like that. Is that something that you grew up with, too? Were you also like being taken care of by your parents, or how was like your family life when you were growing up? Growing up, uh, it was, it was my, my, my family was poor, you know, we, we, when we got to the States, I remember living in, in, there was a point I remember living in the car. There was another time where we were living in the hotel in Skid Row, um, things like that. It was a struggle. My, my parents always worked hard and, those, and things like that. And they, eventually they got to a point where they got stable enough. But I remember the hardest part of that. And, and I didn't want to, I didn't, I, I wanted to make sure my kids didn't have to go through that. So whenever I was doing good, I know my kids were doing good. You know, I like, like you said, for example, Destiny was, she's my, my oldest, my firstborn. So, I always try to take care of her, getting her all the things that she wanted. But um, I, I mean, I, I even up right now, even up until right now, I try to do that and you know help out with everything I can from here from Mexico. You know, yeah, it's a little bit harder, but it can't be done. You know, you just got to fucking echarle huevos. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, as soon as as soon as well, well I think we'll, we'll get to the TJ part. Um, so you were how old were you when you came to TJ? When you were finally like the last time you got deported? Uh, it was in two thousand nine. So fuck, was that? 15 years. 15 years ago. Yeah, before that last time, were you getting deported back and forth before that? I've only had been deported once before. Okay, and what was it for? For uh, possession of a firearm, which is a felony, you know? And yeah. So the, the first time was, uh, the first time I got deported was possession of a firearm, was, um, which is an aggravated felony. It was a deportable aggravated, aggravated felony. The second time I ended up going to jail was for the, when I ended up going to the county for the same because I didn't go to probation, I didn't show up to probation, so I got violated. But because I got deported, and I was supposed to report, so I ended up getting violated. That's when you know. That's when I ran into you in, in, in the system, and um, and I I just I was like I figured I'm gonna do finish doing my time, and then I'm gonna get deported again. But that wasn't the case. I ended up fucking the, staying all that. It was like I think 13, 14 months in the county, and then after that, I ended up going to immigration feds, and then they told me sign here, you're gonna get deported. Hey, tomala. I, I ended up getting picked up by the feds. They told me now nah, the federal judge wants to see you. So I ended, I ended up going to the feds and and was there was there for a minute too, fighting my uh, my case. But it was just that that case was based on my my aggravated felony, but which is deportable. But it was just illegal reentry. That's why I ended up getting doing time for the last my last term. Um, you know, when when I got locked up, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if I knew or, or did not know that you were locked up. But you know, when I saw you at East Max, right? And I was like, oh fuck, I got somebody, you know? Cause I was, I was, it was my first time getting locked up and shit like that, I was 18, you know? I had no idea what was going on. Um, I saw you and like, you really made it really, really easy for me to to adapt, you know? Like you hooked me up with the, the County Blues, the fresh ones. You taught me how to like, you know, how to spread and everything. You introduced, introduced me to all your homies. But how was it for you? Were those 13 months difficult? Or for you, was it like easy to get adapted to the county jail? Cause they say the county is worse than, than anything else, right? Yeah, the county was worse at the time. I don't know about now, but back then it was active. Um, but I was, I mean, I was kind of used to it. You know what I mean? I had been in, going in and out. So it, I was used to being there, you know? And then it's like, Going back and then running to the same people that you always run into, you know, and then get transferred from one part to the other, from the old county to Supermax to East Max, and so you run into the same people, and it, it kind of gets to a point where it gets comfortable. It's not, it's not like you're not like ah fuck it, I'm gonna go there. All right, I think I got somebody there and shit like that. So, you know, when you got there, well, I, was, I was comfortable. You know, I was doing my thing, and then I had my hustle going on too with the drawings and shit like that. So, you know. And plus, I was doing all right. I had we had money, so you were eating good, motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? We were, we were eating good, you know. At the fresh blues all the time. Fresh we blues. You know, it was it was a trip because when I got in there, they gave me like some like size large and some crusty ass blues. Yeah. And the first thing you're like, no, 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 hold on, put these on. And they were like creased up. The the white letters were perfect and shit yeah. like that. And I was like, damn, so we really got it like that in here. 
Yeah, it was it was it was a good time. You know, it was a good time there. <laughs> yeah, I tripped out too because uh, you know how they had like uh, like in the I guess the day room or the front part where they had like TVs and places to sit. Yeah. I wasn't really expecting all that. The bunch of phone uh, the the phones right there. It, it was a trip, you know. Yeah, to me, I got I got scared straight after that. I'm like, I'm not getting locked up no more. And then I had a baby right after that, so I straightened I straightened out. But that's not typically the case for everybody, right? People are usually in and out. Yeah, people just, you know, once you get institutionalized, you know, you're in and out, or you're fucking up, you know? And that's what was happening with me, but but it, was, it, it wasn't it was the case that I was fucking up. It was just more the case that, you know, I had um, I had to had probation, and I couldn't show up to probation because of my deportation and shit like that. So, you know, I got lucky a couple of times getting busted after getting deported, going going to jail and getting released over there, you know? I got released off of Norwalk, off of Norwalk, they call it. I got released from there, and then I got released from... From Downey, también another time, and you know I got locked out. But then they they ended up going and looking for me. You know I ended up getting picked up in in the projects and Watts. You know over that. You know it was a mistake release, and yeah. they came to get me. Yeah, um, you know when you got released and stuff like that, it was like you're like kind of living with like looking over your shoulder and stuff like that. It was hard for you to get around. Yeah, it is. It, it, it gets uncomfortable. Though. You know you can't you can't do shit. I mean for once I couldn't get a license, right? So I couldn't drive. You know, and then it's like. Just walking down the street, a uh, fucking hood out sees you, you know, and first thing they're gonna do is you look like a suspect because of the tattoos and shit like that, you know? And that's the first thing they do, they stop you, you know, and search you, and then once you, they fingerprint you or, or look up your name and you're fucked, you know, that's it. Yeah. If you, like, if you get lucky, give a wrong name and you, you get a, a pass, well, then fuck you, good, but if not, then you're fucked, you know? I mean, most of the time I ended up getting stopped, I knew I was gonna go to jail, you know? It, it wasn't like, it wasn't like a, oh, por favor, don't let me go. I was just like, fuck it, you know, I'm done. You yeah. know, I'll go back over there. Uh, but by that time, you know, you're already into the tattoos pretty heavy, right? Yeah, I already had my tattoo business out there, and, and I, was do I was doing really good. I had three tattoo shops in LA, you know, at one point, so. Yeah, tell me how you started that, how, how business was for you. How'd you start I started in, uh, in, uh, in Studio City. My, home, my homeboy had a, um, a uh, smoke shop called Xenobiotic, and he gave me a little a little spot there. So I started I started uh, doing tattoos there, and then um, one thing led to another. I, I, knew I had a couple of people, like my boy, the, the one that I used to go see airbrushing, they had space in, in one of the swamis there. It's called El Faro in, in L.A. So what I did is um, I went there, and, and they rented me a spot that I made for tattooing. And from that spot, everything started taking off. You know, because it wasn't too many people tattooing at the Swamis back then. So I was one of the first to start that shit, that the business there at the Swami. So I, I ended up opening one spot, and then I ended up opening another spot, and then I ended up opening across the street at another spot. So, you know, I had I had three businesses at one point, yeah. airbrushing, and then I had an airbrush business too, so... It was, it was, business was good for me, you know? Um, you know, obviously right now we're inside your tattoo shop. It's a beautiful tattoo shop. You have multiple tables, so you have people working here too as well, right, doing tattoos. Yeah. Why do you think successful in business? It's just persistence, bro. I, I know that. There, I've done, I've done, I did other businesses before that didn't work out, but. Like what? Like uh, my first airbrush business didn't work out, you know? And I, and I remember uh, when I first started that. My jefita's the one that put up the money. I remember she put up $700 to open up in a little swap meet and didn't work out. So I felt really bad that, fuck, my jefita's struggling, you know, and borrowing money and helping me out to try to start, to start a business. It didn't work out. I just, it wasn't making the money and shit, you know. And so I kind of just readjusted a lot of the system that I was working and, and doing. And, and, and one of the things that I do now and, and all the business that I do is I go into it into it with a positive state of mind, you know, I try not to focus on what if it doesn't work out, you know, I try to do like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this, and then have options to, if it, that doesn't work out, then I, I got to do this now, and I got, and so, to not let it fall, to not let it, you know, go to failure, I just, I try to, I try to be, do everything in a positive state of mind, everything I do now is like positive, 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 you know, never with the, never with the, with that negativity of shit, it might not work out, or or not taking risks. You know, I like I like taking risks because I know, you know, I'm pretty big, I've been pretty successful. 80, 80, 90 percent of the time, I take a risk, it works out for me. You know, but um, I, I don't go in blindfolded tampoco. I I do the math and I study things and I look at the environment where I'm gonna do and the you know the people and shit like that. So I, you know, that that all those all those things add up and and help me. You know, they have helped me to get where I'm at now. What high school did you go to? Did you graduate? I graduated, I, I went to, I went to Edison Junior High, I went to Carver, I went to uh, El Camino High School, I went to Jefferson High School, and I graduated from Fremont finally, so I graduated from Fremont High School. Which one was your favorite experience? Um, I'd have to say that 
El Camino was one of my favorites because that's when uh, it was like it was like 91, 90. So it was like the graffiti scene was popping, you know, and um, and that's where I got a lot of my uh, artistic abilities as far as graffiti goes. I met a lot of good uh, artists back then. Some of the some of the artists that are really well known now in the graffiti scene, I got to meet them there. And so they gave me a lot of clichés on, on how to do that. That was one of the you know, one of my my good years. And uh, and then graduating from Fremont, you know, that, that was like the last school I had already gotten kissed out of the district. They they that was my last option to, if you fuck up here, then you're done, you know. So I graduated from Fremont High School and graduated with honors. Got a scholarship to USC, you know. I did I didn't finish it, but yeah, yeah. I went to USC, you know, like my daughter. That's right. And um. But I didn't finish my scholarship because um, I started working for the movie industry. I started working for Warner Brothers and Disney, doing all the backgrounds for cartoons and all that shit. So, you know, like all, all these, like I said, all, all the airbrushing thing led, led to all those positive things that happened in my life, you know, so. Yeah. How'd you get those jobs at Disney and Warner Brothers? Um, I started, I, I used to do these, uh, this youth center in, in Long Beach, California with my friend Richard Brandt. The director there was Heather Green, it was some, some white lady. And uh, I got invited to, to, um, to do some murals there. So I, I did a couple of murals there with them, and then I got invited to do some art shows, and, and I got to meet that dude, uh, Richard Brandt. He was working in the movie industry, and, uh, and he just, he told me, man, you know, you're a talented kid, man. I, you know, I'd like to help you out, see if I can put you in the industry. And I said, yeah, I'm down. So I, would st I started working with them, um, with him. And I, I, used to go, I used to go to school, and then after, uh, after school, or the weekends, I'd go work with them and shit like that. So, and um, it just, it, it got to a point where, I, I, I got pretty well known in the industry too, so I'd, got, I'd have my own people calling me, like Disney calling me to do um, freelance work, Warner Brothers, Rally Studios, Paramount Studios, all these different studios would call me to do freelance work for them. And um, so I had the tattoo businesses, and then I had the movie industry business, and I had the cartoon business, and then I had the airbrushing, so I was always busy, you know, always trying to keep my mind busy. Yeah. And then on top of all that, I was fucking up a little bit, you know? Yeah, <laughs> always, you know, especially where you come from, there's always a, that lingering, like, voice, like, there's always an opportunity to fuck, fuck it yeah. all up, right? Yeah. <clears throat> um, where it was, like, those, those freelance jobs, were they paying really good and shit? Yeah, I used to make a lot of money, you know, I was making, you know, motherfucker, 17, 18 years old, was, you know, I was, I was cracking in $700 a week, you know, and I was still in high school, so it was, I was making good money, you know, I was, I was, it was, my 11th grade, 11th, 12th senior year, I was making good money. And then I was doing airbrushing at, at, at school también, you know, taking my first tennis shoes and airbrushing. Back then, they used to have the Converse and they flipped the, the lengua over and do the airbrush. So I, was, I had a lot of work with that and I was doing that at home. So, yeah, it was, it was, I was making good money. I can't complain. I had, I had a car, you know, in high school, so it was good. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as like the art, you know, obviously you're a really good uh, artist. Do you feel like that's something that you're born with, that it comes naturally? Or did you have to put in the work to actually get good at becoming an artist? Every, everybody has to put in work. I mean, you can, you can be born with talent and, and like to do something, but everything is practice, bro. I, I learned that, you know, that I mean, I, I remember drawing since I was a kid. Since I, I, I mean, since I can remember, it was I always been art and drawing and, and painting and shit like that. But, but, um, like junior high and, and high school was like one of the biggest influences in me and as far as practicing goes and starting to get better at it. And then the graffiti thing really inspired me, like shot me through through to try to pursue that, you know? Yeah. Um, I was going to say. So, uh, you know, people would look at you with the tattoos and everything. They would never assume that you got a scholarship to go to USC. How was your experience at USC? It was good. I, I, I was there for... Um, Dure como unos six months only, you know, I went, I was there for like about six months. It was a good experience. I got to work with a lot of different people. You know, I got to work with people that are, that are like later on in life, uh, artists that worked on a lot of the movies that, that I, that I see now, you know, it's like talented motherfuckers that were going there, you know, and I, I was blessed to be a part of that. It was, um, my, my, my scholarship was fine art. So I it was, it was, it was more like painting and, and and drawings and all that type of shit but these people um that i got to see later on in life like years and years later that i got to see be working in the movie industry i ran into them in a different way but um they're fucking super successful man they were like yeah i finished my fucking school and you know i'm doing fucking good and you know it cost them a lot of money to finish you know they, they didn't get a scholarship they just had to pay for it but 
You know, they're fucking, they're doing good. I mean, USC is one of the best schools, and that's why I'm proud that my daughter's going there. You know, she's going she's gonna to be doing good in life, you know? Yeah, all your classes were like art classes? Yeah, I just had nothing but art classes. It was, it was like a strict, it was like a strict scholarship art program that I was going through. And then at the end of the program, you, um, you had a show, and then if, depends how you did on your show, whatever, then you, they would continue to have you there. So I did the first month and it was good, but I was already working at Warner Brothers. I was doing all these things. So I didn't, I didn't want to go back to work. You know, I yeah. didn't want to go back to school. I was like, I was making money. And then at that time, my parents got separated. So I had my little brother with me and, and I was kind of putting him through high school and helping him out. So it was like, it, 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 everything worked out fine. You know, I think that it, it, things happened for a reason. And, and I think that all that worked out exactly the way it was supposed to. Yeah. You know, you've been through a lot of hardship as far as, you know, being separated from your kids, you know, getting deported. Um, how did you deal with that? Like, did you ever go through like depression or like any mental stuff or is that is something that you didn't really focus on? Because I remember growing up back then, too, like mental health wasn't really a thing like you. There is no such thing as a man being depressed and stuff like that. But your what was your personal experience dealing with all the trauma? I think I think that I probably did go through some depression time, but never realized it. Like you said, you know, didn't think of it as a as a as a as as depression i just maybe thought of it as maybe just sadness and things like that from being out here especially being out here you know being um getting here and 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 going through the situation where fuck i couldn't see my daughter or i, I couldn't touch him or, or shit like that you know and it's like those are that's one of the things that got me to stay here when i when i got here it was everything was hard i, I used to tell my daughter man you know what like, I can't give you the things I was giving you when I was there, and I, I think I might need to go back, you know, I need to start um, start doing something and and, work, and go back over there and just start making money again, and, you know, so we could be all right. And I remember the, something that impacted me a lot from her told me that, she goes, you know what, Dad, I, I'm tired of going to see you behind that fucking glass window, behind that those bars, those fucking phone calls. I'd rather come see you and TJ, so, you know, just fucking stay here, you know? Stay here, TJ. I can come visit you, and that's it. You know, I don't have to go see you behind bars or go visit you at Wayside and all that shit, you know? Yeah. And I was like, man, you know what I mean? It makes sense, you know? It's like, yeah, I, I think I need to do that. And if it's coming out of her, then, it, you know, it means a lot. I got to fucking focus on That's why I focused on just staying here and, and making things happen. You know, a lot, a lot of kids that would have um their parents in this situation as far as either either being deported or being in prison like they will take it as like oh you know so i have the perfect uh, excuse to fuck up but obviously destiny didn't why, why do you think that is she was destiny was raised different you know um her mom has, has a lot of influence in that she's 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 a her mom's a great mother you know she inspired her to doing a lot of different things and you know even, even though my, her mom and, and i'm a ghetto as fuck we were both ghetto we, you know, most more, more your tia was pushing her towards a different kind of lifestyle, not this, not this lifestyle that we grew, grew up in. You know, we grew up in a way different lifestyle than her. And it's crazy because my my daughter, she's she's not into any of that shit. You know, she's scary, scary as fuck. You know, when it comes to that, and it's good. I like that. You know, yeah. To just tell, I tell her she can't be too scared, but you know, she just has to learn. You know, learn how you know, she has to live. A little bit of both lives so she can have better experience in life and and could, could better deal with situations like hard situations when as you know growing up yeah um so you you end up here in tj what are some of the first jobs you got over here what are the, one of the first things you did like like when i do i remember the first day i got out is then it was halloween it was um october 2009 it was halloween and um and there was a lot of people out here, drunk motherfucking people. And so the, my first, even before I got out, we were on the plane. And uh, and I could hear all these motherfuckers on the plane. Oh, when we get to TJ, man, we're going to go party. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And, you know, go get some bitches and get some, get high and this and that. And I was just like in my head, like, motherfucker, you just coming from the joint, homie. You know, like, you know, get some rest or something. You know, like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just like listening, whatever. So my, 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 the first thing that I did when I got out, I got here and I was walking right here downtown in Centro and um, I got a hotel room and I just fucking went in there and I fucking crashed out, you know? I needed to get some rest and I fucking fell asleep. And I remember the next morning, the first thing I did is uh, I already knew some people that had tattoo shops here. So I went and asked for Holly, you know, I was like, man, I think I'm, I'm going to be staying here. So I want to, I want to work. Is there any tattoo work? And they're like, no, right now there's no Holly. So I ended up um, through another friend of mine had a, um, one of his buddies had a uh, like a little mini Home Depot here, 
por allá por las 5 y 10, it's kind of far from here. So he told me, hit him up, you know, he might have work. So yeah, he had work for me and I, I, I'd go work. I would go over there um, three times, four times a week and he'd give me 200 pesos a day, which is the equivalent of like what? It's 12 bucks, you know, some shit like that. Like $12 a day. And um, so I did that for, for like, maybe like two months, two, three months. And, um, and, and at that time, I was, I was staying with my cousin, one of my cousins that lived out here, he gave me an opportunity to stay with him and I told him the situation and he helped me out a lot. So, you know, I, lo I love him and his family for that. They opened up their, their, their home to me. And, um, and I just got a phone call one day saying that there's an opening at the tattoo shop at Turner Center if you want to go check it out. I had already been at that shop before asking for Hale and the Vato, like I remember the day when I got there, he, he looked at me kind of sketchy, like, like, nah, yeah, I ain't got no work for you, shit like that. But there's, there's one of my boys, Rancho, called me and told me, hey, well, you know, I'm going to send you over there. I'm going to recommend you and this and that. So the vato called me and he told me, quieres venir uh, uh, to interview, whatever. I said, yeah. So when I show up, he was surprised that it was me because he remembers me when I went to West Frale. And um, he goes, hey, pero el Rancho te recomendó. And, you know, and I go, yeah. She goes, hey, pero I don't like problems here. And I go... I go, no, 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 te lleve, no te dejes llevar por lo que ves, you know, I'm, I'm a different motherfucker, you know, it's not, it's not like that, yo vengo a trabajar y, you know, aquí está mi trabajo. So he, I started off with, he giving me two days a week, and then I went from two days to five days, and I went from me opening the shop to closing it, and me being in charge of the motherfucker, you know, and, and I was there for a year before, um, before I ended up opening my own spot, you know, and, and uh, my brother would always tell me, my brother would always tell me, like, you gotta open up your own fucking place, man. And I used to tell him, man, I'm not ready. You know, I don't know how shit is out here. It's different than over there. He's like, nah, you got this, you got this. And I told him, first it takes money and, you know, and and then I, I just gotta get the information right with everything, how everything goes, the paperwork and all that. And um, just one day my brother showed up and um, I was living in a little ass trailer home. I was already on my own. I was living in a little ass trailer home. And then he showed up and he was tripping out like, damn, like, like, motherfucker, this is how you live, you know? Like, I'm like, yeah, this is a little, a little estrellita and the bathroom was outside and shit like that. And he was like, just get, get dressed, let's go party, let's go drinking. We ended up coming to a center, we ended up drinking, and he told me, open up a fucking bank account. I'm gonna give you money so you can open up a business. And I kept telling him, nah, man, you know, we gotta wait a little bit, bro. He's like, fuck this shit, you know, you can't be like this, though. This is not the way you, you are, this is not. The, your lifestyle, you gotta fucking get on it. So um, he did, he, um, Monday came, he went back, Monday came, I went to open up a business. And it's like, I, I, I mean, it's like, like everything lined up perfectly because he deposits the money, I go to the bank, he deposits the money, so I go to the bank and check, and the money was there, my brother deposited me $10,000, he told me, use the 10,000, open up a fucking business, get, get your shit on the, on the, you know, building your little shop out here. So coming out of my shop, I get to the corner and it was, I see a, a for rent sign. That's where my old shop was at, you know? Mm -hmm. The one I lasted almost fucking 12 years in. So I get there and I rent the spot. I talked to him, I rent the spot. I told my brother, man, I already got a spot. He's like, what? I said, yep. Fuck it, if I'm gonna go for it, I'm gonna go for a four. So I got the spot. It took me about two months to fix it up. And um, well, fix it up to a, where it was working, you know, functioning. And, um, and then it just, that ended up, Escalating to something better and something bigger and something bigger and something bigger and it got to a point where I remodeled the shop You know thanks to other friends of mine out here in TJ my friend Jimmy un saludo and um, And they said I remodeled the shop and it became one of the best known shops out here in TJ You know and I made a name for myself in the tattoo scene out here in Mexico Thanks thanks to my brother. Thanks to everybody that helped me out out here. Yeah, why no mercy tattoos? No Mercy was a crew that I that I used to be a a, a, a tank crew back then. It was it was um, it's called Show No Mercy S N M, and um, my boy sees the one that taught me how to airbrush. He was a part of that crew, so um, it it was just like I told him, man, I'm gonna open up a fucking shop that you know can can see I'm in No Mercy. I just want to you know make sure that it's all right with you and your boys. You know they were like, yeah, go ahead. So it just became that No Mercy, and I like the I like the name. It's catchy and you know. And there's no mercy in the motherfucking house, you know? Yeah. How, how, did, you, did you even think twice about opening up a business in English in Mexico where Spanish is the number one language? Spanish is the number one language in Mexico, but here in TJ, it's not, bro. Okay. There's a lot of people here that speak English. It's like, it's like a 50-50 here, you know? A lot, a lot of the people here, especially here in the, in the downtown area, a lot of people speak English. So 
you know and it's like i hear the people like the, the paisas from out here they come in like it's no mercy you know and they say it perfectly they know how to say it and they know what it means and it's crazy you know it's yeah. like so it's not it's not uncommon for people to to read in english here even if they don't speak english you know do you see a, a big change as far as like the culture of tattooing from when you started to now? Do you feel like it's a little bit more like uh, like more normal, more easy? Like you see tattoos in the, in the face and stuff a little bit more normal than before? Yeah, it, it's a lot more accepted now here. Even here, like uh, one of the things that I did when I got here was uh, go apply to the call center. And, I, and they're not going to get no promotion. Fuck them, you know? <laughs> but um, yeah, I went and the motherfuckers didn't give me a job. They told me that, uh, you know, I couldn't work because of my tattoos. And I was like, all right, cool. But now it's different because now... You got all these motherfuckers getting deported, all blasted up in the face. I mean, they hardly got any skin in their face. And they work at these call centers now, you know? Yeah. It's a big thing out here. It's, yeah, it's, which is weird because you're on the phone. It's not like people can see you. Yeah, but still, you know, that's, it's, it's crazy, but that's what it is. You know, but then back then, they didn't give me a job, which is, and like I said, it worked out, it worked out fine for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there a big difference as far as, like, you know, like, uh, sometimes, like, I've gotten a tattoo. I got tattoos from someone that... The, that was straight out of prison and they had like the same gun, right? And now like the, the artwork is getting a lot more, it's a lot nicer, it's a lot better, right? Uh, do you feel like there's a different type of, like do you look at people who have like prison tattoos and then like nice tattoos differently? Or like what do you think about the nicer tattoos that everyone's getting nowadays? Because usually you start off with like ugly tattoos and you graduate into good ones, right? Right. I, I, I like both tattoos, I like both styles, you know? Uh, to me, like, prison tattoos were an inspiration to me, so anytime I see something, I, I always, I like it and, I, and it, it, it keeps inspiring me to to um, to fuck with it. When I was in the system too, I did tattoos there too. So, you know, I was a part of that that whole um, learning. I mean, I, I when I when I got to the system, I knew how to tattoo already, but you know, getting more experience as far as tattooing Jaha's tattoos, you know, and it was good. I liked it, and like I said, like, I like the the style, like the way they look. I mean, now the work that people are doing is fucking incredible, bro. They got all these motherfuckers doing some amazing shit, you know. Especially now they're using more like rotary machines when back then was more like um like uh the old school machines, you know, bobinas and things like that. But all the rotary machines now are inspired based on Jaha's tattoo machines, you know. Mm. So it's it, it's a lot easier to work with them now. You don't even need fucking clip cords. You don't need nothing. It's like battery operated and shit like that, you know. Yeah. And I, like I work with those machines now. They're very light. And um, and you could do you could do anything that you did with the old machines. You can do them with these. And it seems like kind of better at times, you know, with all these kids that are coming up right now doing all these fucking amazing tattoos. And you'd surprise, bro. It's like fucking crazy. How they do, how they get down with the with the tattoo shit now. Uh, nowadays, people are using like iPads and like they're tracing, they're like designing the 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 art on computers, then transferring it over, right? And I'm not sure, I'm sure you know exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. Uh, are you like a purist? Like, do you feel like <clears throat> a real tattoo artist should be able to do it freehand, or you don't really care as long as it looks good, whatever the customer wants? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one of those that likes to speak on that, you know. But um. I like doing shit old school way, también, you know, at times, like, it, it's sometimes when you're going to do a design and it's very complicated, then I go about it and do it just like everybody else now, you know, the, the iPad and tracing it or, or I printing shit out and then tracing it by hand. Most of the, most of the things that we do here, we trace it by hand here at the shop, but we do have the machines to print the designs out and just straight to the skin. But for the most of it, we don't do it like that, you know, and it's like this shop is known for handwriting and things like that for cursor for lettering so a lot of this that we do is freehand here yeah what do you feel how do you feel about fools because you know back in the day first you would get like below the neck blasted and then they'll be like your hands then your face you see a lot of kids now like the first tattoo is like on the brow or on the face how do you feel about that yeah and I, like a lot a lot of those kids if i'm here i usually don't don't tattoo them if, if first of all I, i'll ask them you know how old they are and then they look i mean most of them they look young as fuck so you know they're just getting inspired by all these musicians and shit like that but they don't they don't have no career in music they don't they don't have no career in art or they're not tattoo artists and shit like that so for the most of it i try not to tattoo them you know they're gonna fuck themselves up and and they'll thank me later for it you know yeah but when when like when i've got to tattoo people in their face but they, there's people that i know that are into the 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 industry and they're really good at what they do so they're gonna live off this shit forever i know that you know and so but for the most of it yeah, we get all these kids that walk in here and one tattoo in the face. Like, I don't fuck with them, you know? It's, I, I know that they'll thank me later, you know? Who are some of your uh, favorite tattoo artists growing up and now? One of my biggest inspirations tattoo was uh, 
Pint. His name is Pint. He's still over there. I used to see him at uh, in Lingwood at Wicked Tattoos before I started tattooing. Like professionally, I used to go and watch him work. And um, he's the one that actually told me to go, um, gave me a piece of a magazine and told me, man, I told him, I want to I want to get into professional tattooing, bro. He's like, uh, he went into a magazine, ripped the page out and gave it to me. And he told me, yeah, go buy this machine. He gave me some machines from Joe Kaplan. But yeah, Pint, saludos, man. You're an inspiration, my boy. He, uh, he's, he, right there in Lingwood, he was at Wicked Tattoos, and now he's, he's I mean, he's a dope-ass artist. He was one of my biggest inspirations. Uh, for someone that wants to get into tattooing now, like, just straight, someone that's, say, 20 years old, or even somebody older, like, what are some of the things that you would, like, you know, coach them on doing first before they actually start tattooing, or, like, well, what's the way to get into the industry? I think that one of the, one of the biggest things to do is, uh, you gotta be, have a, uh, like, art background, you know, you gotta like it. A lot of the people that are doing it now is just, they're looking at it in, um, in an economical way, monetary wise. So they, they feel like, oh, they see they see somebody have a badass shop or he's doing really good. It's like, oh, fuck, I'm gonna get into tattooing just because of that. Yeah. But they don't have no fucking tattooing skills or no art skills or shit like that. So I think that's, that's one of the things to do. Like one of the things that I'm 100% on is um, if you're gonna get into an apprenticeship to work, to, to learn how to tattoo, you gotta do an apprenticeship the way it's supposed to be done, old school ways, you know? Fucking go into a shop and, and you're gonna be the, the the mouse of the shop that does everything cleaning scheduling um setting up stations you know taking care of everything 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 you know aquí in mexico le dicen el monstruo del estudio which is the motherfuckers are going to do everything for everybody but your your reward is you're going to get an apprenticeship and you're going to learn right and you're going to fucking when you're done with your apprenticeship you're going to be having work and and you're gonna get introduced to everybody that's well known off out here, you know, in, in Mexico. And this is one of the shops that that provides that. But ahorita no tenemos apprentice, you know, because we've we've had some before, and people are not that persistent. They they, they see everything so easy. They want they want to get here, and just because they did a good line, they're gonna go tattoo, and then they go tattoo in their house, and they're like, "Fuck that apprenticeship! I want to make money now." So yeah. Uh, were you big on? Because in, in in LA, there's always like tattoo expos. Were you going to a lot of those out there? I would go into, I never really participated in any in LA. I've, I've done a lot of them here. I've, here I've been in Costa Rica, Guatemala, and um, uh, Venezuela, like all these different expos here and then all over Mexico, you know, here and the, and the expos. In the US, I never really got to participate in any because I didn't feel like I was good enough to do that yet, you know? And I would see some of the work and I mean, it was like, like even then, fucking, I was amazed by a lot of the shit that they were doing. And it was like, fuck, I, you know, I'm not I'm kind of embarrassed to put my work out there compared to these guys' work, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, my, my work was acceptable and it was good work. And like looking at it now, maybe I was at that level, but I just didn't think of it that way. I didn't see it that way. It was more like, no, I just come and get inspiration and, and, and see how these guys work and shit like that and try to apply it my, to my abilities you know in, in the u.s there's like west coast style tattoos there's like east coast style tattoos there's white people tattoos mexican tattoos uh here in or i guess in from mexico to the down south like different countries different states what are some of the styles that are like really popping right now the west coast style the chicano style the chicano lettering the the cultura which is the cultura all all that all that stuff it's it's really big out here the cultura, the lettering, the Chicano style, the prison style tattoos, all that is, is one of the things that is really, really big out here. People look for that shit all the time. And it's like, and, and they chase you. People people that come get tattooed, even white people or, or tourists that come to Tijuana, they're like, hey, we want to get some of those, um, some of that style from like LA, like all those gangbanger style that get the writing in their faces and their necks and shit like that. Like all that shit, I want to get something like that. So they look at it that way. They, that's how they see it, you know. Some of them don't even know a name for it. They're just like, oh, those gangbangers get that good those tattoos and they want that shit, you know. <laughs> is, there, is there certain tattoos? Because, you know, you could, with your background in the streets and, like, you know, being uh, locked up and shit, there's certain tattoos that, you know, you're, you're not really supposed to get unless you, you're supposed to get them, if you know what I mean. If someone asks you for a tattoo that you know they're not, or do you ask questions or you just give, it, give them whatever they want? Nah, I usually don't, don't you know, I, like, we, people usually don't come and ask, you know. Okay. And it's like, um, and the people that do come and ask is, is people that I know that, you know, they got it coming or that they deserve it or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. But for the most of it, people don't come and ask for those kind of tattoos, you know? Uh, it's like, um, like, and if somebody comes with a design that has that, 
I'll do an interpretation of it. I won't do, I won't copy it or do, you know, it's just like, so it won't be uh, a misunderstanding with anybody, you know? Well, like you, Especially for that person, you know? Like you warn them and stuff, like, let's do it this way. Just, yeah, you, I tell case. them, yeah, no, I don't say just, I just, I just give them my artistic opinion. Okay. I don't tell them why, I don't, you know, I don't explain myself. I just like, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to change this, put this here, and it's like, you know, make them feel like, because they don't know what they're getting. So it's like, yeah. it's easy for me to just kind of talk them out of that shit, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think you're known for? What is your tattoo style? For I'm known for a lot, my lettering, a lot of my lettering, um, cursor writing, lettering, all that stuff. Yeah. What is your favorite tattoo to do? I like doing portraits. One of the things that I like to do is portraits and lettering, cursor writing. I love doing cursor writing. Yeah. And that's all because of the airbrushing, you know, like airbrushing yeah. led me to that. What's harder, airbrushing or tattooing? Now I think that airbrushing is harder for me because I have I'm rusty like a motherfucker. But, but no, yeah, I no, I think that tattoo is harder. Yeah, it's 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 more delicate. You know, you have to be more careful with what you do. Airbrushing, you repair it, or if you fuck something up, you just buy another garment and do it. You know. Yeah. But tattoo, you know, you got to be very careful. But it's different. It's harder. Uh, what's more annoying, tattooing family members or people who are, are like just regular public people? Family members. Why? Definitely. <laughs> because them motherfuckers be like ex excessively, um, how would you call it? They're, oh, it's just, it's fucking annoying because they're, you know, they, they don't let you work comfortable. They're, they're excessively fucking on you about what you're doing. Are you going to do this here? Are you going to add this here? It's like, man, let me fucking finish. And then, you know, <laughs> what if we do this here? Can we add here? It's like, like, I'll start with something here and then ended up wanting, they want something over here and shit like that, you know? Yeah, they tell you, only want this. And then, like, you can just Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like. And they always take shit for free? Sometimes. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't really, like, I don't really trip on that, you know what I mean? Ta free tattoos is not a big deal, but, pero este, when they, when they get to a point where, oh, yeah, do this, and then it's like you get it done. And it's like, nah, don't trip. Well, then can you do this one too? And it's like, oh, no, motherfucker, not, not today. You know, or, but, come back. Yeah, come back another time. You get your uh, turn again. Uh, okay, so also too, like, okay, so, so since you have a lot of experience being a tattoo artist, what do you think is like the proper, well, you know, tattoo shop etiquette as being a, the person getting the tattoo? Like, what? Some fools want to come in faded. Some fools want to come in with their homies. Some fools want to do this, ask for that. Like, what is the proper way to act in a tattoo shop? One of the things that, that, that we get annoyed by when, um, and I'm glad you touched that subject because that happens to everybody, all the tattoo artists, is um, when they come in with family members, especially if they have a wife and, and, the, and the, the dude's going to get a tattoo. And it's like the wife is like on top of you. Hey, do this, AK, and, and telling the artist what to do instead of the guy that's going to get the tattoo. It's, it's got to a point where I've told him, you know what? I'm tattooing him. He's getting tattooed, and he, it's his decision to get what he wants. I give him an option. That's it. I'm not going to change the design. If you don't like it, then maybe we just shouldn't work on you, you know, or just go with somebody else. Yeah. It got to a point where I have to say that, you know, because it's so fucking annoying. Yeah. You know? And I think that the best way to get here is sober. Get sober, you know? You don't, I mean, getting all fucked up here, you bleed a lot. It, it's just, it gets messy, and then people are annoyed. And and if you're drunk, you really, you really not conscious enough to know exactly what you're going to get or how you're going to get it. So it's like, you know, just be here normal, you know, sober. You want to get fucked up after? Go ahead. You know, we don't, we, we don't, we don't trip on all that, you know, and even here at the shop sometimes, you know, you, you're getting tattooed and you want to have a drink with the proper saran wrap and all that shit. Yeah, I want to you have a beer, whatever, you know, be cool, but don't get here fucked up. If you're here, to get, if you get, if you get here too fucked up, we won't tattoo you because it, first of all, sometimes they are annoying. They're annoying like a motherfucker drunk and they want to change the design a million times and they bleed a lot and they keep moving and then it's like. It, it's just, it's annoying. But one of the most annoying things is that when fucking you have a, like a fucking third, third party family member coming in and like trying to switch up the design, telling you how to do your job. And it's yeah. fuck, that's fucking annoying. You know? I think anybody at any job, so when someone tries to, try to tell you how to do your job, like a backseat driver type shit. Yeah, you like know that. I mean? That shit is crazy as fuck, man. <laughs> and we get that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably one of the biggest pet peeves, right, for tattoo artists. Um, nowadays there's a, there's a big movement for like, uh, numbing creams or like people like basically like anesthesia, anesthesia, whatever, like being asleep for your tattoo. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I mean, it's cool. It, it, it's working out for the people that are getting it done, you know, and if you get it, if you get it done that way, fuck you wake up with a big ass fucking piece, you know, you got three, four people working on you, you get it done. 
I don't got I don't got nothing against it. That's cool. You know, I I think that that's that's a good thing for people that don't want to go through the pain. You know, if you got that option. Yeah. I think that I mean I think that the the best way to experience a tattoo is going through the pain and going through the through the whole original process, but. But if you don't want to and you don't have to, shit, more power to you. you don't like, have to earn, like earning it, right? Like you have to earn the pain, earn the tattoo. Um, so, like, do you feel, because I, I remember I feel like like tattoo artists or even Chicano culture in general, like it was more like an underground scene, right? Like if you know, you know type shit. Now with Instagram and social media, it's, it's very, getting very popular and easy just to walk in anywhere and get any design you want. How, how do you feel about the culture? Like, did you like it more when it was a little bit more gatekeep, like a little more underground? Or now that it's really popular, like, like uh, is it better? Is, are, are tattoos getting better? Like, how do you feel about the whole culture? It, no, I, I think there's pros and cons, you know? Um, I, I, it's, it's good for the industry because it's been growing a lot. And you got all these fucking talented motherfuckers coming out and doing some amazing ass work. And the work is from, from 10 years ago to now, it's fucking changed a lot. So you see the transition of how everything goes. And I think that, that all that has to do with being more exposed, being more open. Be more open, you know, and because back then it was more like, you know, I'm not going to tell you where I buy my shit. I'm not going to tell you how to do this, you know, and, 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 you know, back then it was okay to be like that because it was a part of being this way and that industry was wanting to be kept that way. But, but I think that once it opened up, it opened up new, new, new fucking doors for everybody, even for, for us, for the people that, that grew up doing this many, many years ago, because now you got all these fucking rotary machines. Now you got all these things that, that, that evolved into from doing, doing something way old school style to doing something very moderate now, very modern. And, and the work now, it's fucking amazing. You know, you, you're surprised and, and you see these kids that are 16, 17 years old doing this kind of work. And it's like, you know that. You did something right, not 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 in general, just me, but I'm saying you did something right by that, by letting that shit opened up, you know, it's like, fuck it. I, it was, I think it was inevitable, and, and anyways, inevitable. You know, people, people were so, so, um, so sketchy back then when it came to getting information, you know. I, Pine, I was blessed with meeting Pint, but I had asked other people prior to him, and they didn't want to give me the information on where to get my shit at or how to go over buying a machine, you know. So I, I, I kind of experienced that too. The gatekeeping. The gatekeeping, you know? Yeah. But no, I think it's better. I think it's, I think for me, it's better. It's better that I went that way. It's like I said, pros and cons, because now you got all these people. It opened up this whole thing where everybody wants to fucking tattoo now. And, and anybody can just go buy a machine now and they don't have no experience. So they're just out there fucking up people in their house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, other than TJ, what is one of your favorite places to go tattoo people at? I like going to tattoo people in Guadalajara. Why? Guadalajara. It's uh, that's where I was born, and um, I know a lot of the artists over there. So you know, and then um, and Mexico City too. I know a lot of people. In Mexico City. Mexico City is like, it's like another LA type of place. You know, there's not like not like um, not like the people, but like or the deported people or shit like that. But but in a way where the industry is so big there, tattoo industry. There's shops all over the place there too, and it's like it. All the, all the Chicano style artwork and the lettering and stuff like that, a lot of it's coming from there, man. They have a lot of motherfuckers that are doing some bad ass shit there too. You know, and and so I like going there. I have a lot of friends that have tattoo shops out there. So mostly that I and I have a lot of work when I go. So yeah. it's good, you know. How do you feel about touch-ups? Working on other artwork, other pieces that are already on there trying to fix it up. Do you do you dabble in that or you like kind of move, you don't try to touch it? Uh, sometimes I do, but for the most of it, if it's for the most of it, somebody that wants to get a, a, t a tattoo touched up is usually pretty fucked up. So we recommend covering it or doing something else on it, you know? Yeah. To touch it up, it's very difficult, especially if it's all deformed and looking all fucked up. It's it's hard to touch something up like that. Maybe just doing the whole thing over, it works out better. I'm, I'm down with doing the whole thing over, but touching something up exactly the way it is, and it's, nah, I'm not too crazy about it, you know? Yeah. Do you feel like your taste in tattoos has changed as far as like tattoos that you've gotten when you were young to what you try to get now? No, I, I've never been. I mean, I don't have that many tattoos. So, and I've been I've been in this shit for going on thirty years, you know. And it's like the tattoos that I have mean something to me. I have my arms. Some of my arms are blank, you know. So it's it's not like a, it, it it wasn't like trendy for me. It was like everything that I got means something to me. It was something that was meant for me to get you know it wasn't just like oh, some random tattoo being around the homies i mean i never got a uh tattoo in the joint you know and in the system so it wasn't like something that oh, i want to get tattoos just so i can look cool and shit like that you know yeah what do you think is the biggest misconception of a, of a tattoo artist 
that it's a that you know for the most of it I don't but not not so much now but back then it was more like that fool's a fuck up you know he's a fucking marijuana or a cholo or 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 just somebody from the streets you know that didn't have an option but to just go into tattooing you know because I had I had that been told to me before yeah you only tattoo because you can't do nothing else nobody else wants you around and shit like that you know uh, what are some of your favorite tattoos that you've gotten on you um, I got my daughter Yelena's portrait and then um. One, uh, my daughter Destiny did a, a tattoo on me, so that's one of the tattoos that I have. That's one of my favorites. She did it right here at the shop, you know. Well, at my other shop. Yeah. She was little. She was. She was like, I don't remember. She's like six, seven years old, you know. Yeah. Um, are you okay with your kids getting tattoos? And they're old enough, yeah. But you know what's crazy? Destiny doesn't like tattoos, so you know I, I don't have to worry about her. She doesn't like tattoos, you know. What about your other kids? My daughter De uh, Yelena, yeah, she's. I mean, Aliyah, she fucking loves tattoos. She's little, she's only eight years old, but she's already wanting to tattoo and, you know, drawing. And she comes here and she's like, put me a tattoo, dad, like, and then with a marker and shit like that. So okay. I know she's going to be a little fucking headache later on. And then my daughter, Yelena, she likes tattoos también. She's not all full, but she's, she's, she's with it. She likes art too. So lo que es Yelena and Aliyah, they're, 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 they got our, our basic, uh, artistic abilities that are similar to mine. So I think they're going to go through that, to, through that route, you know? Yeah, recently, uh, I've noticed, I'm not sure how long you've been doing it, but recently you've been uh, a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You've been a little bit more vocal, I guess, on Instagram as far as like, you know, hashtag Deported Life. You right. Know, what's the movement behind Deported Life? It's crazy because um, I, I, start, I started that whole Deported Life thing, not even thinking about it. It was, it was kind of like... Um, I would see myself thinking about driving through the border and seeing San Diego and then being out here and it's like, damn, you know, this is crazy how my deported life, how everything is with me now, you know? And I was like, maybe I should just start putting it out there, you know? And I did, I just started putting it out there in how deported life is out here, you know, as far as um, the style, the, the way we live out here, you know? And then the, one of the biggest things that, that influenced me to do that is the mis misconception that people have of Tijuana, you know? Everything that you hear in the media, somewhere else, especially in the States, it's negativity. You know, I, I've been here since 2009, bro, and it's like, I've seen more fucked up shit in LA in a two year period than all the time I've been here. I know there's shit going on, but if you're not involved in that, and it, it, you know, if you're not fucking around, if you're doing things right, then you don't have to worry about that shit. You don't have to worry about those, those type of things. They're not out there looking for you. You're not like a, or they're not looking for you, the deported person to, I mean, the, the tourists to come out here and fuck with you, you know? It's just like, it's, it's, it happens everywhere. And I try to put that out there and, and, and show people how we live out here, how we're doing it, you know? It's, it's you know, I'm not rich, and, but I, I live day by day, but I'm comfortable and I'm, I'm happy with where I am. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I was blessed to get deported. It changed my whole life around and my mentality and it humbled me and it put my, it, you know, put my, my feet in the ground and, and made me realize that, you know, that, you don't have to fucking have everything to be happy. You can have a little bit, just enough to where you're comfortable and you're good, you know? And I wake up happy as fuck. I come to work all the time happy as fuck. I travel. I eat whatever the fuck I want to eat. I I go shopping at the little tianguis over ruedas here thing, spots here. And, you know, and I got no shame in that, you know? I'll go buy me a a pair of shorts that are used, you know? and But it... It, it humbled me to do that, do that type of shit. I like it. It, it makes me feel comfortable with myself. Y estoy apoyando a the people that are selling there too, you know? Yeah. People out here survive with, with $30, $50 a month. And I've seen that off top, top hand, you know? So it's like, you know, I, I, I want to be that person. I want to be just like that because now I don't have what I had at one point, but what I do have, I want to try to make it last and, and make it right for me and, Enjoy it to the fullest, you know, not, not desperdiciarlo, not, not fuck it up in, in, in everything on, in every way. Like when I was doing it back home, I'm gonna call LA back home, you know, like when I was back there. So it's, it's, it's a good experience and, and it makes me feel good to put these videos out there so people can see. And it's like the, the reaction I get is, is positive and it's doing, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing because people are curious and asking now, you know, when back then it was just like, like, Oh fuck, TJ's fucked up, you know. Now they people ask me, "Hey, I've heard this shit. Is that true?" It's, uh, no, it's not like that. It, shit like that, and it makes me feel good, you know. It makes me feel good that I'm able to do that, and I get people coming through the shop now, and, and they come in here and they ask questions like that, you know. 
So how has it been for you? And you know, I got deported just a couple of weeks ago. How you know how do I go about it? And you help them out. You try to you try to do what you can for them. You know. Yeah. As far as you know, how to get your IDs and all that shit. We give them information on how to do all that. I don't remember, but like in 2016, I used to come to, to the dentist. I used to have braces. You know, yeah. you can't tell no more because I, I never wore my uh, retainers. But I used to come to the dentist, and one of the things that I wanted to do it for like maybe a year or two, but it's, I would hear the same thing: TJ's dangerous. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, but then little by little, like the first time I came was like, just come, say what's up, get my 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 shit and bounce. And the next time I'll come, eat, and then bounce. And the next time, you know, I'm going to stay for a day, stay for two or three days. And eventually, like after the two or three, I think it, it took me like four years to finally finish the braces. Eventually, I, I kind of fell in love with TJ, you know. Everything's uh, less expensive. The people here is dope, you know. Like people here are like, you know, they're not, it's not fucked up. Like people make it seem. Why do you think, what, what, what do you think it is that misconception that TJ is all fucked up? What is it? I just, I mean, the, the way we look at it, and, and we get together talking about all that, a lot of us that are actually deported and, and shit like that, we talk about it and it's like, I don't know if it's, it's just that over there in the States or whatever, they don't want people to come out here and spend their money or, or whatever, you know, they just want to keep people away from here. I don't know if that's what it is, but yeah, it's, it's just like making it look like if it's the worst place on earth, you know, and like I said, it, it's not perfect, you know, and there's shit going on, but it doesn't mean that it has to affect you or there's there's shit going on everywhere. You know, like I said, I, when I lived in LA, I saw a lot more fucked up shit there, living there than than since I've been here. So it's not it's not a it's not a concept where where you know you you're you you have to focus on all the fucked up shit that happens. You gotta just give it a chance and come out here and check it out, you know. And, and I try to provide that for people and man, you gotta come out here and check it out. This is different, you know. Life out here is different. You can go fucking buy a Bell Street Charon and Walk down the street, eat it comfortable, smell the fucking wet dirt, you know, and when it's when it's raining, you know, and 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 see the view, you know, like from my house to 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 come to work every day. I have to see San Diego. I have to pass through there, so I see it, and it reminds me of of how I lived over there. But it it puts me like like now I'm in a comfortable spot. I'm good here, you know, and it's like I don't need I don't need to be back there no more. I don't I don't even want to go back over there no more, you know. Yeah. If it would ever get to a point where I could go back. It would have to be legally and just to go visit for special moments, for special cases. I got to miss my daughter's quinceanera, as you know, you know, Destiny's quinceanera. I got to miss her graduation from Cal State LA. Uh, you know, I got to miss her graduation from Cerritos. She went to Cerritos, right? Yeah. Was it? I think so. Damn. <laughs> but yeah. We'll and, cut that and, out. We'll cut that out. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, like, I, I, and then it's like her starting USC and like, uh, and I'm probably going to get to miss her graduating, getting her master's at USC, you know. For those kind of moments, I'd love to be over there, you know. Just go one fucking day and come back, you know. I have no business in the States, brother. Nothing at all. I don't, I, I, there's, none, there's no need for me to be there. I'm comfortable where I'm at here, you know. Yeah. Is there, is, there, is there an opportunity for you that's been deported to do that kind of stuff? They say, that, they say there is, but, you know, I got deported for life. Um, and I, I've heard of a couple of people that got deported for life that got a, a visa to go through. So, you know, I, I just have to give it a shot and see if it goes through and that's it, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm not interested in doing it now. I'm going to wait a little bit more and, and see. I, I got to look at the process, see how long it takes and try to get it done before Destiny graduates, you know, and, and see how that goes. Yeah. But, yeah, just for those kind of moments or, you know, or emergencies and shit like that. But other than that... Food, you know, you know what we do? We ask our customers that we get a lot of customers from the states. Bring us Burger King. I mean, uh, bring us Jack in the Box or bring us Taco Bell or bring us Denny's or In and Out or that that type of shit. We miss that, you know. Yeah. That, look, we miss food. those type of things. The comfort food. The comfort food, yeah. Uh, you know, technically, I, I would, I would, say, I would say that TJ is kind of like a tourist spot, a tourist attraction. Like for certain people, right? They love, they love the the style out here, the the pace of the city, and there's always fun things to do. Go to Ros Rosarito, Puerto Nuevo, Lobster, whatever it is. What are some of the things that you like to do uh, that are fun, that are not so touristy, like Rosarito and stuff like that? Like, what's what's what what does the city provide as far as like attractions? They have museums here. They have a couple of museums here. They have um. Like bowling alleys, you know, I like doing that shit. I like, um, they got different pool halls, uh, we do that. And one of the favorite things that I like to do, and even when I was in San Diego, just go to the movies out here. It's a lot cheaper, bro, you know, go to the movies. The only fucked up thing about that is sometimes they're in Spanish and you can't, you know, mm -hmm. it's not the same. You got to watch them in English, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's, uh, I think it's called like Cine Cinepolis or something like that. Cinepolis is one of them, yeah. Yeah, there's one, there's one in uh, in LA too. But yeah. I think the movies are in English with Spanish subtitles though. It's like, you know, it's a little different. Yeah, no, I like going to the movies. 
and go to the beach, hanging out at the beach and shit here, you know, mm -hmm. and not not just like in the tourist part of, of where the beach uh, where the people hang out, but just like we have um we have like a boardwalk here in Playas. Just fucking go and walk at the boardwalk is cool. Have a coffee there and chill and relax, you know. You know, on the news over there in LA and stuff, English or Spanish, right? Uh, all they talk about is the border crisis. The border crisis, people coming from South America or different parts of the world, even China and stuff. You know, trying to cross the border. Um, do you feel like that's affected uh, the lifestyle or like our crime or like it's 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 all bad? The the people crossing over like doesn't really affect. Isn't as bad as they make it seem. I think that I I think that it, it does. Like I don't see the I don't see it whether it affects or not. You know I really don't because uh, now they're not they don't they don't come to the center no more. Like the people that are coming from South America and all that, they're staying more like in Otay area. They're they're not on this side. Um, out here the la the last big big um, group of people that we had was the Hondurans out here, but it ended up all bad for them because they started talking a lot of shit and people here are not gonna have it here. You know people here from Mexico, the 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 Tijuanenses from here. They're gonna have you come to respect the, the Mexican people and shit like that, and and they're gonna deal with it the way they know how, you know, and so and, and that's just that's just how it is and that's how it happened. So after that, ya no tenido, ya no habido muchos problemas. The other people that came in and they they're around, but they function. They're they they're working. They're hardworking people. Is the Haitians? A lot of Haitians are here, but they never made an issue or fucked or fucked around or anything they got here and need, need and did what they needed to do which is work and which is a lot of us that went to the states or that go to the states try to do just get there want to work they did that so they got acceptance here you know but everybody else that comes here fucking up they're gonna run into a wall you know yeah when people come visit uh either from Mex other parts of mexico or from the u.s what, what do they come get like what are they asking for like oh where can i get this where can i get that what, are they, what do they want they they want to get a lot of those, from the U.S. They want to get a lot of souvenirs from here, you know, like a lot of those sweaters that look like trapeadores and shit, like that type of. I don't know what the tela's called, but oh, yeah, yeah. a lot of that. Um, and then a lot of them want to go to Rosarito, Puerto Nuevo, to the lobster, the, a lot of the lobster thing. Este, they and most of the people that come here is like young, young the younger crowd, so. They want to know about Papa's and beer. They want to know about all those, all those spots. I mean, it's like tourist attraction spots, you know. Yeah. And it's like the party scene. Y pues, of course, La Coahuila, you know, que no se diga. Everybody wants to go there. If you come to TJ, you know, in La Coahuila, you didn't come to TJ, you know. <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, um, but you're also you're also a small uh, another business owner for a whole different type of industry, right? You're in the nightlife industry, or the bar? yeah, I have, I have a sports bar out here. Too. Yeah, tell me about more about the sports bar. It's uh, it's called Los Tarros. It's not San Revolución, but it's just like a sports bar, and it's 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 like headquarters for a lot of the homies that are deported. A lot of people are deported, so we hang out on the weekends there. You know, everybody goes and hangs on. A bunch of the homies, we have that spot to go hang out at. So, and it's cool. And it's like we play all kind of music. We play Spanish, English, old school. And then it's like when a lot of the homies are there, it's like all they want to play is like fucking gangster, yeah. gangster shit and, and funk and all that. And, and it's like I switch it up a little bit because not the not the not all the clientele is, is 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 homies, you know, and it's people like us, like me. It's a lot of people, local people here. So, no, I put this thing where, you know, you motherfuckers get three songs and then they get three songs. I mean, <laughs> it's like that, you know, you keep it uh, democratic. Yeah, you got to keep it that way, though. <laughs> Um, what are some of the spots like? Say, say you're gonna stay for a few days at NTJ. Well, what are some of the hotels you recommend? Tikwan is one of them. Cesar is another one. Este Las Torres is not here in the Centro, but Las Torres is another good one. Um, fuck what other one? Like on this side, I, I don't recommend too many. It's, on this side, yeah, like Tikwan, um, Cesar's. Baja in, I mean, Baja, Baja in. Like those three I recommend, they're, they're good, they're good. Catalina Hotel, like three, four. Those are good hotels. They're nice, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think I see that Tijuana is, is really yeah, nice. Yeah, and then the, there's the other ones, you know, you, you can just go like fucking. Momo style. Yeah, like just straight fucking. <laughs> Hostel. Fucking, <laughs> even worse than that, fucking mattress is like this thin and it used to be like that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Okay, so a lot of people come for TJ, right, uh, for the tacos, right? Everyone wants TJ style tacos. TJ style tacos in LA are, is big right now. They're like in every corner, right? Birria, the res instead of the chivo, right? Um, what are some of the, the underground, like uh, maybe hole in the wall spots that you like to like to like eat at? What's the good food around here? Um, we go, we go to the spot. Se llama La Sinaloa. It's a, it's a it's ladies. It's like older ladies. 
I have a bomb spot and it's like the food is cheap and it's good as fuck, you know, and because we've tried all the nice restaurants out here and it's like the holes on the wall are the best, the best spots to go in here. At the Mercado where, where we went earlier, that spot is good, you know, and fucking you see how the food they give you, you know, it's like, and it's cheap too. And it's like, there's another Mercado, the Tacos de Viria, there's different spots right here in the center where you can go eat bomb Tacos de Viria, you know, not that expensive. And then you got the most popular ones, which are the ones that you fucking see on Netflix or, or you fucking hear about on TV and shit like that, which are really not that good, you know, compared to all, all the other little spots that you can check out. You got to just come out here and try it out. You know, it all depends on your gusto because you can get to a little puesto. You can watch those tacos that are going to be fire as fuck. And you're going to go to that restaurant that you saw on TV and you're going to eat it. It's like, damn, that shit was not that good, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I get, I, we get that a lot here, you know? Yeah. So people usually come here. We recommend them to little local local spots right here. Get the economy going through all the little help out, all the little people that are working around here. Yeah. But they're good food, you know? It's really good food. Yeah. Um, if someone wants to, like, reach out to you, like, and tell you, like, you know, how to adapt here, what are some of the first things you would do? Someone, like, to say, let's say they want to move here. What are some of the things you got to get in order first? Well, first you gotta make sure you have your ID and shit like that. You know, like it's better if you have if you have double nationality, you know, you can get a fucking excuse me, okay. you can get your ID from here from Mexico. It's called the INE here. You, if you can get that, it's important for you to get that. You know, if you're just gonna be, live in, be working in the states and being here, este, you I I I don't I'm not sure how it works. I don't think you can buy property if you're not Mexican resident. You know, you have to be Mexican resident in order to buy property here. Pero si te quieres venir nomás a rentar, anybody can rent a spot here. They're open. You know, it's a lot more expensive to rent than in, in certain areas. The closer to the border you are, the more expensive it is. The further you are, the cheaper it is, you know. You can get you a nice place far from here for 350 bucks, you know, $300. A little two, three bedroom house, nice. But it's not close to the center. Here, $350 not going to get you shit here, especially here in downtown, you know. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it depends what you want to do, um, how you want to live, the style you want to have, how much noise you want to hear. That's, those are the things that you have to first look at, you know, before moving out here. Um, do you feel like um, it's easy to buy a house out here? Like the houses are pretty affordable? They were getting more expensive now, but yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're way easier to get here than the States, you know? Yeah. It's, um, and you could just buy buy a property here and just start building on it little by little. If you live in the States, that's what people do. They come and buy a big-ass terreno, you know, pay $20,000, $25,000, whatever. Depends where you get it to, you know? And you could build you a nice fucking house here, you know? Yeah. Um, do you feel like uh, TJ's getting a little bit more like, you know, in LA right now, the whole big, the big thing is gentrification, where like all the people that like were originally there for 20, 30, 40 years, they're not there no more. Like all the rich people are moving in, all the poor people have nowhere to go, they go further out. Do you think that's happening in TJ? Are things getting more commercialized? Yeah, things are getting, yeah, TJ's growing like a motherfucker, you know? And um, everything's getting so much more expensive here in the Centro. I remember when I got here, it was, a lot of this stuff wasn't that expensive, you know? Pero the, Living, rent, all that shit has has skyrocketed out here in Tijuana. But that's because there's so many people here now and the economy is growing. Centro's get, getting all these new buildings coming up. And it's like it's like one of the biggest one of the biggest cities growing that are growing fast as fuck out here right now. So everything's getting more expensive and it definitely is affecting, you know. Nice. Um well man, I appreciate you giving us the opportunity to let us interview in your your badass tattoo shop. How do people like if they want to get some work done? And say they uh, they live in LA. How do they get in contact with you? They can go through Instagram, you know, through um, direct direct uh, the direct message to the studio. It's uh, no mercy at no mercy tattoos, and or at, at Spanx fifty two through my through my page, you know. Okay. And um, and yeah, we we'll, we we'll, we work by appointments, especially coming from over there. It's appointments only. We do accept walk-ins, but for the most of it, it's it's appointments. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think is next for you? Like, what's uh, you've already conquered and done a lot here. In the small time that you've been here, like, what do you feel like is in the future for you? Like, what does the future hold for you? What are some of the things that you look forward to? Maybe that's not even not even tattoos, not even the bar, like something else. I want to have like uh, my own little clothing line. You know, I want to do my own little clothing thing out here, and um, and focus on that. 
Um, and then also, uh, I want to get back into paintings, start doing like art shows and things like that. You know, it kind of, all this shit with the tattoos and the bar and, and, and trying to get ahead and all that kind of threw me off my, my, my regular art, which was doing paintings and things like that. I want to get back into that. And I want to focus on that. I want to start selling artwork and, and just selling my artwork and putting it out there, you know? Okay. That's one of the things that I want to do. Fuck it. Well, man, I appreciate you um, letting me interview you. Um, so find you on, on is Spanky52 or Spanks52? Spanks52. And then No Mercy on Instagram. No Mercy Tattoos. No Mercy Tattoos. And then what was the name of the bar again? Los Tarros? Los Tarros. Yeah. I, I Los one, Tarros Sports Bar and Grill. I went there one time. It was dope. Yeah. I like it. Check it out. Time. It's cool. Um, if you guys are still watching, make sure you guys like this on Instagram or any clip that you guys are watching. Make sure you guys show some love. Five stars on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, appreciate you guys pulling up. Uh, any, any last words before you go? Any shout outs or anything? Thanks, thanks, Ned, for the for coming through to Tijuana. You know, it's always good to have family out here. That's right. You know, and um, I just want to thank everybody that, that that supports and that shown support. And you know, and 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 as far as if you have somebody deported out here, man, give show them motherfuckers some love, man. They people need it out here, you know. So help them motherfucker out and 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 show them some love, even though even though they fucked up a little bit over there, you know. I'm sure they didn't get here for being such a nice motherfucker, but <laughs> but you know, help them out and and. And, and give them a shout out, you know, and, and, and ayúdenle un poquito, you know, y este, you know, and I want to give a shout out to my daughter, Destiny, very proud of you. My daughter, Yelena, love you and I'm proud of you too, mija, my son, Panchito, and all my baby mamas. What's cracking? <laughs> shout out to all baby mamas. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for watching. We'll catch you guys later. Pull up, turn up, stay lit. Let's get it.